We have Eddie Willis. Yeah, this is, this is, this is Eddie Willis. Right? And Mr. Ray Manette. Yeah. And myself. And we represent and play with the Funk Brothers. And uh, we are so happy to be here and to keep the name going for all the Funk Brothers before us. And it's a wonderful place. It's great. The people are treating us great. We love Phil Collins. And uh, tell you the truth, we're hope, we hope we come back someday. Really do. Thank you. <laughs> I bet you that was a horse face, man. <laughs> I mean, this is the first time anybody's ever actually filmed in uh, in my little studio at home because usually home is home is a place where I don't let anybody in. But Dana was there with the camera and uh, insisted, uh, which is actually an advantage now looking back on it, um, to f sort of film the process. So, um, you know, it started, I guess, uh, oh, over a, year, over a year ago, probably February last year, and uh, I wasn't going to make a record, but it just was suggested to me to get my juices flowing. Why not do a covers record, which is something I always wanted to do, but thought I'd never be allowed to do, <laughs> um, of all other people's material. And Motown was not a big jump for me because that is where I grew up, really. Uh, so I picked out my favourite songs from the catalogue, the darker songs, the ones that people wouldn't know necessarily, B-sides and things. And a few other hits of the day that I thought were over, overlooked. And I just started to, to do, you know, paint these little pictures. And uh, really it was, it was, you know, it was like having fun. It wasn't working because at the time it was um, miles away from ever being finished and I didn't know how it was going to be finished. Like at this point, I was spending a lot of time on programming drums. You know, normally I would just, if it's real drums, eventually it's going to be real drums, I'll just lay down a skeleton, disposable drum part. But now, of course, I had a problem with my hands and didn't know whether I'd ever be able to play again, so I was actually spending a lot of time programming the drums in case I ended up having to use them for the right notes. You know? learn a lot about uh, learn a lot about uh, old school writing I mean it's like a brain puzzle you know it's like playing a video game but it's much more fun you have to you know make something paint the picture that was painted a long time ago obviously this is a nostalgic point of view but for me it's not just nostalgia it's not like I think I hear these songs and I remember, you know, like what happened, you know, when you were 16, 17, 18, but it's not that. It's just that these are fantastic songs by any day, any day's standards. And, you know, it kind of excites me. What is it? <laughs> what is it about that barking song? Levi Stubbs. Stabs. Um, thought it was such a difficult act to find. Now we're going to take the clock back. Don't want to spend another day here. Oh, I want to split now. I have to say, this is the only room in the house with the gold records on the wall. This is the Dig Me room. Every other, <laughs> every other room in my house has nothing at all, so it all ends up staying in this room. Because I'm the only one that usually ever goes in there, so I don't feel embarrassed by it. But if you're looking at this thinking, wow, he's got all this shit everywhere all over his house, it's not true, I can't. <laughs> I get embarrassed by it. So. Change the key, it sounds like. Yeah, you really gotta hold on. 
So the great, I, I've always, I feel so relaxed in my studio that like all the lead vocals I've done for all my records, not in the same room because I've moved a few times, but I've always done all the lead vocals for the, whether it be Tarzan or whatever in my in my environment. You know, as soon as I go into a studio with headphones on, it kills it. Um, so I've always kept the rough stuff at home. You know, originally uh, my idea was to was to do songs that would surprise people. You know, that uh, they hadn't heard before, like in my lonely room and uh, a few other things, and things like uptight. I would never have touched, but in fact, it's turned out to be one of the best things on the record. So this was a four top song that was a minor hit in England and apparently it's one of their favorite songs they did but it just wasn't a, it wasn't a big hit in the, the states and, and then of course came reach out I'll be there and everything turned around For me to sing this song properly, I had to take it down in pitch, and it suddenly lost the sweetness, the sweet spot of bam da bam da bam da bam da bam. Of course, I was playing the wrong note on the riff. I found out. It's so weird, you know. You, as a drummer, you kind of think you got it, and then guitarist comes in and says, "Well, of course you're playing the wrong note," you know. And suddenly he plays the right note, and suddenly the sun comes out, you know. But still, it was a it was a tricky song. It turned out well with the guitars, real guitars, real bass, because some songs really rely on the guitar much more, and uh, that's my weak spot. You know, I don't play guitar, so... And guitar samples are very difficult to make sound real. I know these songs backwards as well, but you see, I'm holding the lyrics all the time, just in case. I have to say that I sound terribly impatient in this, just like my dad would. Come on, get on with it. And they, they, they were singing it in the car all the time when we listened to it, and then I came to record it and they were outside playing football. I said, well, come in and sing it then. And it's, 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 it's when you see yourself like this, you think, God, I'm not that. I'm not like that. Why do I sound so impatient? Not yet, not yet. Lift your head up, come on. Have fun, this is work. Terrified. I've terrified them. <laughs> this was the, the day I dreaded, actually. First time playing. First time playing since my problem. So this is my old uh, 64 drum kit, which I dragged out of, well, I used it quite a lot actually, but it's this right period why use more when that's all they used. Antique snare drums always collected those, so this is I'm really trying to, trying to put off the first moment I have to sit down and play actually, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. But at this point it was a question of will I end up using the programmed drums I've done or will I actually be able to pull it together, you know. And I didn't know at this point that Ivan, the engineer, was a drummer. I just knew he was an engineer. I'd worked with him before, but uh, I have to say that without him, I couldn't have done this because with his 
being a drummer and also his knowledge of Pro Tools, he just made me sound good, you know, made me sound like I could play in the end because I was playing like a kid at this point. The very first time I played, the stick flew out of my hand. My left hand was not capable of gripping the stick enough to do anything of any subtlety at all. And uh, Steve Jones, better known as Pud, who's been with me since uh, the late 70s, mid 70s, late 70s. And I also think the way to do with the fills is for me to do one pass like this. Yeah. That's Ivan there. And uh, in the background, John Aaron with the blue shirt, he's the horn arranger. There's one, there's one funny one which is. Every fill on the record is in the place as it was on the original. Because, uh... Ivan mapped it, well, we played it and then just did an example of all the different fills on the album, on the track, and then he placed them. And slowly I was able to play a bit more and he was ne he, he wasn't necessary for him to sort of do quite so much splicing. And Pud's wondering whether he's got to get a new job. Because <laughs> the drumming doesn't play anymore. One of the drum fill book. I just don't know why. I don't know. I never read that page, I guess. <laughs> so this is uptight. And uh, Stevie Wonder played drums on this, I think. And it's very different from any of the other drum parts on the record. It's very animal. Because every time I, we went in to listen to a track, I had to make the decision as to whether to ungaffer my hand or walk around like Strange Love, Dr. Strange Love, <laughs> with a stick in my hand. <laughs> and risk poking my eye out every time I did anything. OK, I'll overdub this hand later, don't worry about it. <laughs> I wrote to the, the Funk Brothers and said, I'm doing this, do you want to do it? Will you do it? And uh, Bob Babbitt, who plays with Chester Thompson, coincidentally, in Nashville, he said he's a big, big fan, he'd love to come over and play. And he asked Eddie, who was one of the original guitar players, and he said, get it on, let's get it on, in the words of Marvin Gaye. And there's another guitar player, Ray Monette. He's, he joined them for Cool Jerk, like late 60s onwards. But I remember sending out an email to the record people and my manager saying, gentlemen, we have the funk brothers. <laughs> now, Bob Babbitt, this is one of the most incredible bass lines of Motown ever. And he played it, wrote it and played it. Now, and I'm sitting there thinking, this is a dream, right? There's this, this guy that I, I've been singing this riff all my life, and now he's playing it on my record. <laughs> it's fantastic. I didn't know quite how to go about recording him because um, it ended up there was within a day there was a routine. They'd play everything together and then we'd go and fix things from individuals. I mean, and Eddie, I have to say, um, Eddie has suffered from polio all his life. So, and now at his age, he can only get around on an automatic uh, kind of wheelchair kind of thing, um, which limits the amount of time so he can come in and listen to a, in the control room, you know. And Ray, his hands are in better shape, you know, Eddie, because of the polio and because of, you know, he's... And, of course, we changed keys. And these guys have been playing these songs for 40 years in the key that they were recorded in. And then I come along and say, we're playing Heat Wave in F or whatever, and suddenly it's a learning curve for them. And some shapes they can't play, or Eddie couldn't play because it was a bit awkward for his hands. So. Oh boy, that's hard on the hands. See? And he would just say, you know, I'll tell you what, I'm going I'm to stand out on this one. You know, and Ray would do it. 
This has been up chosen as the single, which uh, just goes to show that <laughs> it's my fear really, it's because you know this will come out as a single and uh, it's the most me sounding like track. So people have to be educated and I've made sure that this is approached, that they have to be educated that this is an old song and it's from an album of old songs as opposed to a new track written by me or even a cover by me on an album of new songs, you know. Otherwise there'll be lots of tears. Well, I've always loved the song. I mean, uh, no, it's, it's strange. I mean, it is, it is, it sums up the whole thing. I mean, this is a nostalgic trip, you know, uh, as well as everything else. I mean, as well as a celebration of great songs, but, but I did, you know, when I was singing it, I, 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 I did find it very emotional, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's lots of things, you know, sort of your mother's health and things and the losing your hands and you know the ability that you used to have uh, just sort of a passing of time you know things changing and uh, so I think that's why people like, people like it it's because it, you know there's something in the performance but more than that there's something in the song <laughs> 